name is Christopher Mandel. Um, I am in the executive director. I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. <laughs> I'm the executive director of the Calaveras County Historical Society, and I'm also the director of the county museums in San Andreas. Um, I have a international art education. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree at San Francisco State, where I studied uh, abroad in Amsterdam and Melbourne, Australia. And um, I got straight A's all the way through school, including statistics. <laughs> um, and then I had done so well that I got a full scholarship um, to do my complete uh, graduate study in Rome and Italy. And so I studied art history in Italy, which is like having backstage passes to a giant museum that you live in. And um, I settled in Calaveras in about 2019. 2020, somewhere in there, during the pandemic. So, um, let's just get right to it. So, um, this image here, um, uh, I, uh, I really feel like it's one of the most impressive pieces that we have in the Historical Society collection. Um, literally. If the museum was on fire, this is the piece I would run out with. <laughs> uh, this came as a donation from the Peak family, and um, they are objects from the estate of Ava Sirocco. Um, I feel like this image is a summation of the experience of the gold rush. Uh, just look at their expressions. The man on the left has this charming, benevolent smile and a rowdy nature, while the man on the left is equally charming, yet with an endearing smile and a compassionate, tender nature. I don't know if you can make out uh, the veins um, in their arms, um, but their forearms tell the story of hard work. Um, and they're wearing these um, ragged clothes that um, don't quite fit, as you can see with the belts and the rolled up sleeves. This is a tintype, which is one of the first methods of making multiple prints of a single image. Um, and, and you can see up top that their shoes are above them. <laughs> it would seem that the tin was chopped from a bigger sheet of the same image, yet cutting these poor devil's feet off. <laughs> Still, it is such a treasure. I often think that the one on the left looks like me, and the one on the right looks like my friend Noah. But it doesn't quite work because Noah's nicer than me. <laughs> um, I, wanted you to, I wanted to show you this piece, but I won't be discussing photography today because it's outside the scope of this lecture. Um, but if you want me to come back next year, I'll try to present the wealth of photography related to the gold rush. So I'd like to do things a bit different with this lecture. Um, I would be so happy if you would raise your hand and offer your, offer your insights into the works I will present here as we go along. I, I feel that people are often intimidated by art and they don't feel qualified um, to speak to it, but art is an experience and everyone's observations are important. Above all, art, in most cases, is an object. And it is no way smarter than you. <laughs> um, and at the end, if there's time, uh, I'll ask for some final burning questions at the end, but I'm really hoping that you'll ask your questions as we go along. All right. OK. Now, semantics. <clears throat> OK, first, let's go through some semantics here. So what do I mean when I say the art of the gold rush? For the purposes of this lecture, um, we're going to look at drawings and paintings that were created by Argonauts, um, those who made the trek to California with the intention to mine their fortunes. We will be looking at these artists' images that depict gold rush life. And yet another parameter, we will be looking at artists who came to California with some form of artistic training. Okay. so. Let's talk context, and then the introduction will be over, and we can take a close look at the work. So, some artists came to the gold fields and struck out quick. 
and they realized that they could make more gold dust by creating paintings by pa for patrons, um, be they uh, other miners or business owners, then they could make panning for gold in the placer mines. Other artists arrived with the intention to go to the gold fields, but ended up staying in San Francisco and creating artworks for wealthy patrons who had made their fortunes in the Mother Lode region and then returned to the city. We will also be looking at works from miners who struck out and went back home and then created images of their experience in California after the apex of the gold rush had passed. Now, the images these artists created are set amongst some common themes, such as travel, the experience of traveling to California, be it overland or around the horn uh, of South America or through the Isthmus of Panama. These arduous journeys make their way into many of these works. Then there is the work, the, the literal um, documentation of the landscape, um, of the methods of gold mining by miners, as well as depictions um, of the engineering and the use of tools and structures of gold mining. Now, we are very lucky to have these images that I'm going to show you because they solve a lot of questions regarding 19th century gold mining and miners. They give us a glimpse into the practice and how the work was accomplished, but also its impact on the environment. These are the images of miners' work. Now, finally, there is a theme of images of the miners at rest, although they never quite rested. It was more of a time to socialize, spin their gold dust, gamble, and to get otherwise body and out of hand. Um, there are some great images that show this side of mining life and really bring the zeitgeist of the gold rush forward. Gold rush art is precious. So much of it has been lost to us. The great quake in San Francisco and the multiple fires consumed most of the art that was still here after the 20th century, after the turn of the 20th century. Much of the drawings from the field were taken home with the miners and lost to time in the elements. And it is said that we have a mere 20% of what was created by artists of the gold rush. Now, if you haven't noticed, I'm going to say gold rush a lot. I just can't avoid this. <laughs> um, it is important to note that the other movements of people to colonize uncharted and faraway regions, um, the people who went out in search of their destiny in these early years, they weren't in the way of making art. Um, there are very few images of California before 1848. These people uh, set out before this time were dealing with the day-to-day -day life of travel and homesteading in faraway places. Art didn't come with the early settlers and fur trappers. Art came with the gold rush to California because the people coming here were here for different reasons and interest and more temporary endeavors. There was a multitude of people who came to California and all from such diverse backgrounds. It happens that there were artists among them. Beyond the artists traveling to California, there was a great need to document the present. There was a buzz in the air and energy about this movement. The whole world wanted to know what life was like in the gold fields. For the miners, uh, they wanted something they could take back home to remember their experience and relate it to others. There was a demand for art and a market for it. In places where many artists came from, the market was competitive and recognition extremely hard to come by. People saw value in their experience being documented. With all of these grand coincidences in place, we got some pretty marvelous artwork. All right, let's get into the art. All right, so let's start at home with an artist who traversed Calaveras County. John David Borthwick was born in Scotland to a well-to-do family and was formally trained in art. He traveled to North America and first settled in Quebec for about a year. He then moved to New York in 1850 where he became engrossed in the news of what was, go uh, of what was happening in the gold fields of California. He decided to go west, partly for the chance to strike it rich, sure curiosity, but also for the adventure of it. He set off on the Panama route to California the same year in 1850. 
Borthwick had romanticized the lives of the early 49ers, and he set out in their path to follow their footsteps. Um, starting in Coloma and working his way down through the southern mines. He made his way to Calaveras at the end of this trek. Borth Borthwick wrote a very important work called Three Years in California that detailed his journey in California from 1851 to 1854. The work is a first-hand account of Gold Rush life and is illustrated by several etchings. So, um, so this one is called Camp on Weaver Creek. It is said that the figure on the left is Borthwick himself in a self-portrait. And here we find an image of miners at leisure, most likely at the end of a long day panning in the river. The figure on the right was a fellow miner that had showed him the ropes of mining and how to survive in the wilderness. The two split soon after Weaver Creek, but you get a sense in the moment of these two friends enjoying an evening together, be it a meager supper in an unforgiving wilderness. Borthwick was one such artist that found that he could make more gold dust creating images for miners than he could make panning in the river. He would work the claim in the day and make drawings at night. Excuse me. Yes. Um, yeah, so what we believe is that this figure sitting down is actually Borthwick himself that he put in there. Yeah. All right. So this image is titled Chinese Camp, um, and it's fitted into three years in California as part of his, na uh, part of his narrative about Angel's Camp and Angel's Creek. Uh, but according to a close read of his journal, it may be likely that it's a sketch of his neighbors at Weaver Creek, but however, it is a standard knowledge that the Chinese were pushed to the periphery of any place or town site and were forced to work claims that had been abandoned and forced to pay a non-white tax. It must be stated that Borthwick's treatment of race regarding Chinese and Native Americans in his work uh, three years in California is beyond deplorable. Um, perhaps you would say he was a man of his times, but I think it is more personal than that. He was from a rich family and he was dropped in a world with people he had never met before. I think you can chuck it up to privilege and ignorance. Yet, there is still much to be learned from this image. This etching is an interesting look at both work and leisure. In the foreground, there are people enjoying a meal, and in the midground, at the left, there is a man sleeping in a tent. Yet in the background, there is a group of men furiously working. It, it would seem that the Chinese work constantly in shifts on their claims, which would be necessary if the claim had previously been worked. The Chinese were also constantly robbed and harassed, and many would make the gold into ceremonial objects so as to be easier to protect and keep track of. Although it may border on a cruel caricature, it is one of the only works from the gold rush that portray Chinese people. All right. So this work is called Flume at the Yuba River. Now, this is a really great example of Borthwick showing us the engineering and ingenuity of miners. So, uh, I'm sure a lot of you know uh, the methods of gold production, um, but I'll just run, th run you through this real quick. So usually gold will settle at where the river bends. <laughs> and so what we have here is a flume that cuts down this edge here where the river would have had the bend and they're using water power to drill down to the bedrock to, to get that gold that is settled down to the bottom. Now, one thing that is really interesting to me about this is that there's only three people who have created this contraption, this engineering marvel. Um, and it was like this. There was often very few people um, working um, to make really uh, large-scale uh, mining ingenuity happen. 
Now, it also really says something about the impact to the landscape. Um, even the practices of early mining um, had a significant effect on the landscape. Yeah. So, now this one is one of my favorites. It's very fun. <laughs> so, it's just great. <clears throat> Does anybody want to venture an observation about what is happening here? Judith. Hotel, and the men are dancing with each other uh, because there are no women around, and they were <coughs> they would put excuse me a napkin around their waist to determine who was the female and who was the male. Right. <coughs> right. They would dance. <laughs> well, thank you, Judith, so much for stealing the thunder of my next sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here we have a miner's ball um, that can be placed in certainty within Angel's Camp around 1854. Um, there is so much going on in this image. Um, in Borthwick's account of Angel's Camp, he describes these dance parties as just breaking out in the drunkenness. If you notice, there is a meager single violin. Let me see if I can point it out here. Yeah. It's hard for me. To, it's somewhere over here. here. Thank you. It's hard to see this close. Yes. Right. So, um, yet I'm wondering how you would even hear it to dance to in the caterwauling scene around it. There's even people trying to get into the door and can't because the place is so full of wild miners. Borthwick has given us a world here completely devoid of women which we know is not necessarily true by 1854. Um, besides that, there were Mexican women living here as well as native women. And it's a common misconception that the miners' lives had absolutely no women in them. Now, as Judith points out, what is interesting about this is that the men are dancing together. In our accounts of Gold Rush history, it is often left out of the story that deep connections, if not outright love, developed between the miners. At spontaneous events like this, as Judith mentioned, it was common for some of the miners to wear a piece of red fabric on the front of their pants to, single, to signal that they were willing to play the woman for these dances. Um, a detail that Borthwick details implicitly in his written account of Angel's Camp, but I can't go into beyond what I've already stated because I want to keep my PG rating. <laughs> Yet love developing between miners has been wiped completely from the discussion of the gold rush in general. But all that, that aside, what a fun and well-executed etching. Borthwick returned to Scotland and the manuscript was bought by a publisher and he worked furiously from his journals and the drawings he, he had managed to keep from the field to assemble the book Three Years in California which was then published in 1856. So I'm just saying that so that you know that these weren't actually, he drew these in the field. Um, they were taken from drawings that he had managed to keep and then put into um, an etching to be published in, in, in a, a mass production of books. Right. All right. So moving from Borthwick, even though he's great. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about an artist named E. Hall Martin. Now, I'm sorry I don't have an image, but there isn't one to my knowledge. Now, E. Hall Martin made the trip to California through Panama, and embarking on the journey in February of 1849, he arrived in San Francisco in August of the same year. Um, I suppose that there were less people making the trek in 1849, and it, it must have been faster because that seems like record time for a Panama trip, to my knowledge. Is six months reasonable? I, I, I think that that seems very fast, but this was 1849 before the, lots more and more waves were coming along. Now, E. Hall Martin became very sick on the journey and was not able to go to the gold fields as he intended and instead tried to make something of himself as a portrait painter in San Francisco. Although he achieved some notoriety, 
His illness kept him from success in San Francisco, and he moved to Sacramento, where he opened a studio and began work on a trilogy. Now, the trilogy was centered around a romanticized prospector he called Mountain Jack. I say romanticized because he hadn't actually been to the gold fields, yet I should say that he had no doubt met prospectors in San Francisco. This image and the next I will show you in a minute are the only two works related to this artist known to exist. And I find them to be absolutely profound. So, E. Hall Martin's The Prospector. Just look at the gesture. His weight resting on the gun, one foot forward on the rock, the overwhelming feeling of distance in the background. I think any of us can relate to this in our own experience of the Sierras. Uh, when you're out somewhere with a far off view and you're just kind of overcome with the beauty of it all. In the case of Mountain Jack here, I think there is some of this, but it is more for him about the possibility of it all. There is so much forward motion in the painting, um, not meaning that he's going to fall off the cliff, uh, but that he embodies the spirit of the prospector to push on with the intention to colonize and own the land and the mineral wealth within it. Essentially, he embodies progress. He travels with his wooden backpack. Can you imagine that? A wooden backpack, yeah. He has his pickaxe and his gold pan, um, his water canteen. The image is quite helpful in detailing the objects related to the endeavor of prospecting. Now, I didn't put this in my notes, but I've decided I'm going to say it. So, a very important uh, object in this painting is the gun. Now, the gun was for protection. Um, it was also to hunt. But I want it to be understood that these prospectors went out armed into this vast wild, wild. And they oftentimes were paid to or found it necessary for whatever reasons to kill native people, to kill the indigenous people. Um, and I feel like the gun is a representation of this. Um, we often think that the gold rush brought on the genocide of the Native Americans, but I wanted to be clear that there were three different waves of genocide against Native peoples here. There was the Spanish wave, um, and then the Mexican wave, and then the American wave. And I, I do feel like it's important to mention this. Now, this is the second work known to exist. This round view was quite an experiment at the time. I just love it. It's like the perspective of the eye of a hawk as it swoops down and flies by the prospector and the miner. It's fantastic. Prospector was a term used for an original 49er before they were the 49ers because they didn't, because that didn't happen until the 50s. <laughs> um, it is interesting, though, how Prospector evolved into a specialized pursuit uh, as a miner who could find gold as a primary purpose. In this image, the Prospector is instructing a miner on where to find gold in the river below the cliffside, where the miner is asking questions and gesturing below. Now, there was also a third painting, but it was lost. But um, newspapers of an exhibit did give us a, a bit of a description, and it's believed that it featured Mountain Jack with his dog heavily panting and his gun smoking as he shoots a deer. If only we had that third piece. Mountain Jack, the first panel, it made the trip back to New York installed in a ship salon and then was sold to a New York collector and is now in a private collection. Um, this image with the prospector and miner can be viewed in the Oakland Museum. E. Hall Martin succumbed to his illness um, while in the field where he was gathering images of miners um, for his works. Um, he died in 1851 and he was 33 years old. All right. 
Now, this is Judge Smith's photo of donkeys. And I've just put this in here because I think we're getting to that lull. <laughs> so I wanted to, to interject a little bit of humor here and, and give you guys the opportunity to, to um, wake up and recalibrate a bit. <laughs> and I just love this. Uh, Judge Smith was phenomenal with his photography and it's some of the best that we have. And he, he was just great about going around and, and preserving things uh, with his camera. Anyway, I digress. All right. So, <clears throat> now here is um, Charles Christian Knoll. Um, Charles Christian Knoll uh, was German born and he made the trip to California over the Isthmus of Panama. Now, Noll is interesting because he also traveled with an artist named Ayers. And even though they split up um, shortly after um, making it to San Francisco, uh, the two of them both produced um, art in the gold rush. Um, and both of them uh, both died early. Um, Ayers actually died. He, he had gained all of this notoriety and then died in a shipwreck right off the coast. Um, yeah, so I just want to impress upon you the coincidence and, 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 and how, it, how profound it is to have the art from these people um, who were going through such, such difficult times. Now, let's get into Null. So, here we have a painting called Saturday Night at the Mines. Now, I just have to say that this guy on the left just scares me. <laughs> it's totally and completely. I just I don't understand this expression. <laughs> um, the painting was completed in 1856 when Nall was living in Sacramento after his experience in the gold fields. Now you can see several people all living in the same cabin. One is sleeping in the background while all the others are awake. They're weighing up the day's work, which is the action that's going on on the table there. If you can kind of see this scale um, and him pouring gold. Um, uh, and, and it appears to be a pretty substantial um, haul considering everyone in the image has a lively smile, including the guy that scares me. And the counterweight on the scale is at least an ounce, if not two. Now, the full moon and the fire both make the scene very romantic in quality. Uh, the moonlight reflected in the water in the midground is just really nice. It is important to note, and perhaps I'm stating the obvious here, but these artists came with training from European traditions. They didn't just land in California and start making art. Um, they approached the subject matter of the gold rush with an extremely European lens. And that training colors the paintings of Nall, quite literally. Now, Nall was practiced in a style much in the vein of academic art. This was started in the 18th century and was adhered to all the way through the mid 19th century. Here we have two examples of academic painting um, on the left for you. <laughs> um, we have the work of David, um, the Oath of the Heratii, and this is hanging in the Louvre, and it's a knockout if you ever or have seen it. Um, I had an art history teacher that told me that this painting has the best legs in all of art. <laughs> anyway, um, but what I want you to notice is the color palette. Um, these colors, this, this blood red, um, this nicotine yellow, um, kind of drab backgrounds were the spoken rule for painting at this time. Nall brought this to California and it can be seen in his work. Um, so if you kind of look at the color scheme here and then here, you can kind of make this connection. See, this is me on a Saturday night. 
Oh, oh. Mm. <laughs> um, so, oh. Sorry, that, that was such a, a spoiler. Gosh, okay. So, here we have a companion to, um, a companion to um, Saturday Night at the Mines, and um, this one is called... Sunday morning. <laughs> yes, Sunday morning at the Mines. Um, this one is a lot of fun. I, I really want to give you guys an opportunity to point out some things that you might see going on in this image. Yes. In the upper left, they're actually having a fight over gambling. Somebody's about to get killed. <laughs> right. You know, I never made the gambling connection. That's awesome. Yeah, I always just thought, wow, they're just fighting. <laughs> That's great. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, <laughs> and I love, <laughs> I know, <laughs> it's an attempt at great legs. Yes, um, it, it's really funny too because I think that this guy here is kind of a newbie and maybe this guy's saying, hey, this is what your pants are going to look like in three months, you know, or something like this. Um, anything else? Right. And because it's Sunday at the mines, um, I've heard, and I don't know this for a fact, but many miners didn't work on Sunday. And I think that maybe this is maybe um, someone in the church, um, you know, preparing a, less, uh, a sermon or something like this. Well, after Saturday night, you wouldn't expect it to work. Right? <laughs> it looked like a pretty crazy Saturday night. Now we're trying to get absolution. <laughs> um, so this one here, oh, is it, does anyone else want to venture? Okay. Right. Right. So these. Right. Right. Or you know, you know, there's definitely this stampede of of energy moving through this painting, but it kind of seems like these guys are kind of taking control of their boy that's gone drunk and crazy and is about to get hit by the horses. And you can even see where his gold dust is just kind of flinging in the movement of it. And then uh, this is a really nice uh, portrait here where it looks like uh, one person is reading and um, the others are listening to the story. So much going on in this painting. It's really exciting. And this one um, is, a, is housed at the Crocker Art Gallery. Yeah. OK. Now, to the spoiler. <laughs> All right. So uh, there is great drama in the work of Nall, and I just had to show you this one. It just pulls your heart out and stomps on it. It is called simply Dead Miner and was created in 1867. This is again Nall looking back on his experience as a miner and letting us in on the more horrific realities of mining life. Now, the work here was inspired by a poem, and I'll just read it while you um, gaze at the image here. Lost. Lost upon the mountain top, so thickly falls the snow. In vain he turns, the path is lost, he knows not where to go. His faithful dog still follows him, the miner has one friend, who will attend him faithfully until his journey's end. And soon it comes, worn out he falls upon the snow drifts high, no friend to hear his mournful calls, no one to see him die, except his dog, which constant still leaves not his master's side, but bones of both in future will mark where the wanderers died. Oh. <sighs> yeah, <clears throat> and that's an anonymous poem that, that Noll um, decided to illustrate here. All right. Yeah. 
unsee it, but it looks like he has a cell phone. Oh, okay. You know, I almost jumped past that. Thank you for reminding me. What he's actually holding there is a daguerreotype. Um, and so, so this is um, a one-of-a-kind picture from the early pho photography process. And um, they were often housed in a really or or ornate case and you could slip them into your pocket. And what I imagine has happened is that he's looking at this image of a loved one before he dies. And then it just kind of falls at his hand. What a wonderful image. Yeah. Thanks for that, Christopher. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, we, we also can talk about the sublime here. There's the, the way that the that the um, the sky is opening up right with with the dog's mournful howl. It, it's just so much drama here. <laughs> All right, moving on. This piece is called "Miners in the Sierra." In this last work of Nall I have to share with you is a painting entitled "Miners in the Sierra," and it was created in 1851 shortly after Nall had given up his attempts at gold mining. This painting is a collaboration between Nall and a friend of his who would later be his business partner, uh, a man named Windorth. Now, here we have an image um, much like Borthwick's flume, where we're seeing methods of gold mining in the Sierras. Um, there is the long tom there um, at the end of a, of, of a diverted water channel. And it's a hot day, as you can see from the man drinking water um, and, and the hot sun on the Purple Mountains. The miner's cabin is there in the midground. And one thing that I really like about Gold Rush art um, is that you get a color image. Uh, in the black and white photo uh, photographs and, and drawings, we don't get things like their shirts were red. Uh, I find this amazing. Um, this one is, it's really just beautiful. The folds of the landscape with the river receding in the distance, the trees and mountains along the river valley. Uh, these paintings take on special relevance for their early depiction of the landscape of California. What a rich and gorgeous scene. Isn't it nice? Yeah, uh, you guys think so, right? Yeah. Oh, well, I, I'm going to ruin it for you now. So this is not the same valley, um, to be truthful, as depicted in the painting, but it's very close. Um, this is what happened to beautiful places, such as this one that Nall has depicted in 1851, after the advent of hydro mining in the Sierras. Now, it's interesting to look at the representation of the landscape in 1851 alongside the mining practices 20 years later in 1871. They just had to find a way to get more. Yeah. So Charles Nall died of typhoid fever in San Francisco in 1878. Oh, I'm right on time. Okay. You don't know how these things will go. <laughs> um, now, the final artist I'm going to discuss with you today is Albertus del Orient Brower. And again, there is no image of the artist to share with you. Brower is very much an American artist. He was born in New York in 1814, and his father was a sculptor who gave him his first lessons in art. He studied painting more than likely at the National Academy of Design, and he first exhibited his work in 1831. He began as a portrait and a history painter, later turning to landscape. Brower made the trek to California out of curiosity and looking for inspiration from the landscape of the West. He traveled around Cape Horn in 1852, and by mid-1854, he was working as an artist in San Francisco, and then headed for the mining regions. 
He settled in Colombia, where he made several trips to the mines and made portraits of miners and, and painted local landscapes. Now, this is just a knockout, seriously, dancer down. It must be said that the style that, that uh, Brewer approached the landscape with was the picturesque. Um, uh, the picturesque is a technique and a style of painting that he must have been taught in New York, but was very much an English discipline, most oftentimes executed in watercolor and sketches. Um, now, where the picturesque comes from is a bit interesting, and I won't bore you with a lot of art history theory, but I will say that when the picturesque was developed, there was trouble with France in England, and many of um, the English artists looked home to find inspiration instead of going on grand tours or traveling abroad. So what they often painted was pictures of, of ruined abbeys and um, images of the poor and things like this. Now, um, here, Brewer uh, has created um, the image in oil. Um, the painting is called Prospectors in the Sea Era. Can anyone spot the prospectors? Yeah. Right, right. It's a common theme, theme of picturesque art for the landscape to dwarf the figures and the structures. It impresses upon you the great expanse of the land and its monumental beauty. When we, in our present times, refer to something as picturesque, we're often just um, using an adjective for quaint scenery. But in the context of art, it is much more. The picturesque was based in color theory and also in manipulating the way we view a painting. They would use contrasting tones and spots of light to direct the movements of the eye from one place in the work to the next to control the experience of, the view, of viewing the painting. Now, to give you an idea of how this works, if you let your eyes fall on the darker parts of the image, you might start here and then bounce across to the darker sides of over there and then up to the darker sides um, of the mountain shadow. And then your eye would kind of naturally lead down the waterfall into the prospectors. And this is all contrived and intentional. Now, Brewer in his work has tried to capture the monumentality of the Sierra and the prospectors are dwarfed in comparison to the landscape. It is really quite wonderful how the star of the show here is not the figures or methods of mining or anything else we have discussed thus far, but instead it is the landscape that impresses the viewer and creates a kind of awe. Um, with its beauty. Now, here we have an image of Jamestown, which was created in 1855. What a sight this is and what a treasure uh, of a view to have. We get the light on the water, uh, the farmer driving a hay cart, and the folding of the mountains in the distance. In the background, we can make out some structures which Brewer notes as D.O. Mills Mill. Now, I have not had a chance to check the historic relevance of the mill as I'm more versed in Calaveras history than Tuolumne. Um, does anyone happen to know if there was a mill in Jamestown owned by a man named Mills? Darius Ogden Mills. Yes. <laughs> That's so, no, this, this is the stuff that makes me really excited, you know, like... The first bank in Columbia. Okay, very good. So what yeah, we have... the water wheel there, note that on the building. Yeah. 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 See the water wheel? Please? Oh, I do, I do. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the mill, to the mill. That's so do we have any of these structures left? Uh, no. no. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. People hated him. Oh. <laughs> well, that's an interesting tidbit. Thank you. <laughs> I always like the drama in these things, right? Um, but yes, so, you know, right here we have um, a really great image 
of a time in 1855 in Jamestown with um, historical relevance that can pinpoint this to Mills Mill. Uh, that's really exciting to me. Um, uh, we do, we have to take um, the image of Jamestown as being embellished a bit to bring out these picturesque qualities. But it's possible that the road here may now be the highway and the creek may be Woods Creek that runs alongside Jamestown. Yeah. Ha! <laughs> I got it. <laughs> That's probably not the current highway. It was not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yes, um, but somewhere on that side that maybe. Direction. Okay, yeah. okay. I'm so glad you guys are here. <laughs> All right. Um, but yeah, this is just wonderful. And it's so great when we get these wonderful paintings that are so close to home. Now, um, oh, this is the last slide I'm going to show you guys in, in my time here. Yes, go ahead. Before you leave this, that big bunch of hay. Mm. Right. It's never been known for and that's a really important observation because, right, often to make um, an image more picturesque, they would drop images of work into the image. And it's kind of the beginning of a lot of problematic treatments of working people and things that we see later in art. Um, but you're totally right. I, I don't see how he could sit that high and drive the team. And yeah, there's all kinds of things that are wrong with this. But it enhances the picturesque quality. And I think that's more what the artist is after there. Um, but yes, view defensively. <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, so this is the last slide that we will visit of Brewer and the last slide of my lecture and my time with you today. Um, uh, and this is a view of McCallamy Hill. Yeah. And it was created in 1857. Now, do I have any McCallamy Hill folks here? Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, I live in Sheep Ranch, but I've come to understand that all of these places are endearing to us. <laughs> and although we might not live in these communities, we can fully appreciate um, this image. Wow. Look at this. This is so cool. Um, yeah. Um, in, in all honesty, um, I have no idea um, from what perspective McCallamy Hill I am looking at here, but it doesn't matter. It's fantastic. Um, there are a few things worth noting here. That's a bear mountain. See, I wondered if it might be Hogsback. Yeah. I don't know what Hogsback is. Oh, the one above San Andreas. Bear Mountain. Oh, that's. A, oh. I, mean, the one I have to go home. <laughs> no. <laughs> San Andreas in the valley, that north-south running ridge. Okay. Yeah. See, Dave Sanders told me it's Hogsback. I gotta stop listening to that guy. <laughs> I think it's Bear Mountain. I think it's looking down Chili Gulch. Okay. Oh, Stockton Hill, and that's the road on Stockton Hill. Oh, and the Colony wow. Hill's gonna be to the left. Oh, that. See. And at first, I did think it might be um, Golden Gate Peak or Track Mountain, but it it doesn't have. That has a whole ridge off to the right of it. Right. And there's no vista looking at Golden Gate Peak like that. So I think we're on Stockton Hill. And we're looking down Chili Gulch. Isn't that, isn't that an amazing view? It's a beautiful picture. It's so cool. It. Yeah, see, I was really hoping to bring some things that you guys haven't seen, and it seems like I've succeeded. <laughs> um, so I'll just mention some things that I find interesting about this piece. So first, we get a sense of the foreground as being the top of the hill from which we get this view of this wonderful valley. Now, this cart and team of horses has just made its way up the hill and I think is going off along another switchback there. Um, once again, the figures are dwarfed by the landscape. And in the midground, there is already some homesteading going on. And the road winds through the center of the painting in a serene kind of languid way. You can see how the trees have been depleted along the roadway. And it's important to look at the way mining and homesteading impacted the region, and this is a good representation of that. Now, 
My next question was, is this Amador in the distance? But this is already solved by Julia. Um, and I also put, I would love to find out, and now I know, and I'm very happy, so thank you. <laughs> um, yes. Now, there's just some wonderful um, picturesque quality in this. And I really hope that the next time you you have an out-of-town guest and you're out somewhere nice and they say, oh, it's so picturesque, that you'll say, yes, hmm. Now, in what way is it picturesque? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, ha, perfect timing, okay. So, thank you so much for taking the time to think about the art of the gold rush with me. Um, I hope it has piqued your interest and that you might go out to see some of these precious works in Sacramento and Oakland and San Francisco and any examples we might have at our Angels and County Museums. And now, I put up this book because there isn't hardly anything written on the subject of, of Gold Rush art history. It could be, might be my work here, perhaps. Um, but there is this book, and if you're interested in it, I have about four copies in, the San, um, in San Andreas at the museum in the gift, in the gift shop. Um, the book was created for a catalog of, of an exhibit. There's some wonderful information here. Yeah. That was that <coughs> Oakland Museum exhibit on the uh, sesquicentennial of yes. the gold rush. Yeah. There's also a publication of photographs of the okay. gold rush, and then Jim Holliday did a book on the history. So all three of them, and if you go online, look for um, Gold Fever was the title of it. Okay. And you find many, many images in, in that online still from that exhibit. Yeah, I really wish I could have seen that. It, you know, we don't get these images together very they often. In, they brought in paintings from all over California wow. to put into the Oakland Museum for, it was there, what, about six months or a year? It was there for a long time, mm -hmm. almost knew it. Wow. Yeah, and it looks like from the catalog that they got a lot of the images from private collections to be able to, to show, um, which is great. Um, the art of the gold, this is just me summarizing. The art of the gold rush is significant. It is the basis for the powerful presence of art in San Francisco. And it gives us a perspective of a feeling of the times. It shows us who these miners were and what their lives were like. And it also gives us the methods by which the land was worked and colonized. It is heartbreaking to think that 80% of this work is gone to time and disasters. And we are so lucky to have these few remaining works from which to draw the experience of the gold rush. Thank you so much for having me, and I hope to see you again next year. <laughs>